Back in October of last year, I ran a study looking at the recovery rates amongst long haulers seven months after initial infection. Now, we've just clocked a whole year for those infected in the first wave, I thought I'd revisit the topic and see just how well we're doing after a very unwelcome covid adversary. So, over a thousand long haulers completed my survey and the results are, well, let's just say pretty striking. So hang around and let's go through them. My study was made up of 1,104 long haulers, as usual drawn from several international long covid support groups on Facebook and the Body Politic group on Slack. This sample was both self-selecting and self-reporting, and the demographic is largely a reflection of the social media platforms used. Now, normally I would say those caveats won't affect the data too much. However, in a recovery study like this, without collaring every one of the 1,600 people who filled out the first survey back in October, it might be that our results are skewing towards those who haven't recovered, as those who have uh, may have left the groups. Uh, to compensate, I did include a question so we could pair up the two studies, and 409, or 38.5% of this sample, had completed the first study. I'll come on to that a bit later. A quick overview of who our sample was. 82% female and 17.6% male, again representative of the 5 to 1 ratio we've seen in other studies, suggestive that long COVID is an immune-related condition. A pretty broad range of ages, the largest groups here being 35 to 44 and 45 to 54, and mostly from the UK, with the remainder from the States, Canada and Europe. This survey was exclusively for those who'd caught COVID in the first wave, and as we can see here, March really was the month of doom for most people. Now let's look at some of the recovery-related questions. How have people been in the last month on average? Well, this one is really positive. The vast majority, 72%, feeling either slightly better or much better. Do people feel confident that over time their symptoms are improving? Um, still very positive, 61.3% either seeing slight improvement or large improvement. But uh, let's look at the equivalent questions from the survey I conducted at seven months after infection. The vast majority again felt either slightly better or much better in the previous month, 68% in total. And 57.6% were confident that over time their symptoms were improving. So if we're going to extrapolate from both of these sets of data, what's going on? Uh, if they're both true, then we should be seeing lots of people pretty much recovered by now. At this point, I once again engaged the extremely kind offer of assistance from fellow long hauler Dr. Laura Rodrigo to do some more complex data crunching. Now, in a perfect world, we'd do a paired t-test to judge improvements, but given that we don't know which of the original 1600 people the 409 who completed this survey were, we need to do an unpaired t-test and eliminate that group. So, comparing the 654 people who filled in this survey with the 1600 who completed the original, we looked at the two questions. Compared to the early months, how have your symptoms been in the last month on average? And do you feel confident that over time your symptoms are improving? Uh, and we looked at those, both of those questions from both surveys. And what do we get? Well, after running a Welch t-test to compensate for the variance, there is no difference in the degree of recovery in the last month between six months and a year. And the overall recovery impression is lower in the one year group than the six months group. So what's going on here? Why are people saying that they feel like they're getting better, but not actually showing as much improvement as we would then expect? Well, I think two things are going on here. Um, the first and largest part of this puzzle, I think, is that people are getting better at managing their symptoms. So generally, might be feeling a little bit better on a day-to-day -day basis. But the reality of the illness may not actually be that different. And as for the second, well, I know I do this, so forgive me for the projection, uh, but I think most of us have to tell ourselves uh, that we're getting better, as otherwise we'd go completely mad. Uh, this is a completely novel condition with no official treatment and no prognosis. Um, and the idea of not getting better is pretty unpalatable. So I do think there's a degree of perception going on here, along with perhaps a relatively small incremental change. When did people feel like they turned the corner? This one holds up from the last study, with a wave of people seeing improvement around month 6, along with another wave of improvement at month 10. 
Now, last time around, when we looked at which symptoms had improved over time, the top five was at number one, breathlessness and respiratory issues. Number two, fatigue. Uh, number three, headache. Uh, number four, tachycardia, palpitations, heart issues. And number five, neurological issues. So brain fog, tingling, sensory issues. Um, and how does this look? Now we're a year in. Are the improving symptoms still the same ones? Well, still topping the charts is breathlessness and respiratory issues. Fatigue is still in number two. Uh, climbing one place to three is tachycardia, palpitation, heart issues. Um, neurological climbs one place to four and headache drops two places to number five. But these are all pretty close and it's interesting to see that the same symptoms make up the same top five in being the most likely to improve over time. One heartening statistic here is that at seven months in, 8.3% claimed that no symptoms had improved, but at 12 months, this number drops to 6%. And which symptoms have got worse over time? Our top three of shame back in October was tachycardia at three and separated almost by a hair at the top, fatigue and neurological. And at the year mark, fatigue rounds out the top three, but an outstanding new entry at number two for no symptoms have got worse. Um, still holding the number one spot, however, is neurological. Worth pointing out here that, like in the first study, more people reported symptoms improving than worsening, and the numbers improving this time round increased. Number one spots up from 52.6% to 57.8%, and the numbers worsening decreasing with the number one spot decreasing from 35.9% to 31.8%. So essentially, this looks like we've got more people um, reporting more symptoms improving and fewer people reporting symptoms worsening. Now, not all symptoms are created equal. I asked respondents which factors had been the most challenging in their long COVID experience, asking them to name two from the following list. Amazingly, despite the majority of people taking the survey being different, the top five most challenging symptoms or factors remain the same at 12 months as they were at seven months. Despite long COVID's heterogeneity, it does seem that there is some commonality about how it wrecks your life. In fifth place, uh, the impact on mental health. Fourth, tachycardia, palpitations, heart issues. Third, breathlessness, respiratory issues. Second, neurological symptoms, including cognitive dysfunction and sensory issues. And number one, our great friend, fatigue. And while most people watching this will know what long COVID fatigue feels like, I think I probably need to describe it for those uh, of you who haven't maybe experienced it, because it's not like any kind of fatigue I'd ever experienced before in my life before I got long COVID. It's not like being tired and it's not like being run down. It's like someone has removed your spine and you've gone from being an upright vertebrate uh, to one of those jellyfishes you see washed up on the shore. Absolutely flat as a pancake, splatted and lifeless. Uh, when the fatigue hits, no matter what you're doing, even if it's as simple as reading or having a conversation, it's over, you're done. Before I got COVID, I was working full time and running 90 kilometers a week training for the London Marathon. Now I worry about the walk to the tube. Uh, that's why it's number one on so many people's lists. Only 29 people felt able to answer this question on complete recovery. So this sample is too small to draw any major conclusions, but it does seem that the 11th month mark was the most common end of the saga amongst them. However, here's the big one. How much change have we seen in this rather more definitive metric since the last study? Are you able to go back to work? Uh, this is a better assessment of people's well-being than subjective assessments of getting better or getting worse, in my opinion. Um, as if people are able to work, most of them are going to have to, and the limiting factor here is the objective determinator of their health. Um, at seven months, this pie chart didn't look too good. Um, only 6% could work full time without it compromising their recovery. A further 19.6% could work full time, but it was compromising their health. The largest group here, 28.4%, were not able to work at all, and 20.8% only able to work at a much reduced level. So now we've clocked a year, we'd be hoping to see a rather different pie chart. But as you've probably guessed from the title of the film, not so much. So let's take a look. One year in, only 7.7% can work full time without it affecting their recovery. 
The size of the group who can work full time but with it compromising their health has shrunk now down to only 15.8%. So adding these two groups together we have fewer people in full time work now 12 months after infection than we did at 7 months. What's going on here? Well 2.4% have lost their job as a direct result of long Covid. Is that the difference? Or were people trying to work full time at 7 months realising it wasn't sustainable and not continuing to do so now? Given that the red sector here, those working at a much reduced level, has grown from 20.8% to 23%, it seems more likely the latter. Those unable to work at all, still by far the largest group at almost 28%. I ought to just quickly point out that the turquoise sector here, 12% for whom the question wasn't applicable, but even removing this the fundamental relative proportions of these groups remain the same. And with recent reports putting the numbers of people suffering from long Covid at up to a million in the UK alone, this isn't just a crisis for healthcare services around the world but for national economies too. So let me just state that again, 92% of people with long Covid are unable to work as they previously could a year after becoming unwell. And work is only half the picture. Being necessary to survive in most people's cases, it will often come higher in their priorities than other important things in their lives like family, exercise, eating well, living well or caring for others. So think of all the compromises being made in all those other parts of people's lives to be able to even do the work that they can do. That's how debilitating long Covid is a year in. Only 7.7% of patients can do the first thing on the list of life tasks, let alone the second, third or fourth. Those things we normally take for granted, a phone call here, an errand there. Now those are the tasks that get left behind and the cumulative impact on quality of life is enormous, let alone the impact of the symptoms themselves. So whilst I'd like to end this film, like most of my films on a positive note, uh, the data in this survey doesn't entirely support it. However, there is some good news. We're seeing multiple studies now showing improvements after taking the vaccine. Not just the survey I did in my last film. We're seeing symptoms across the board improving no matter which vaccine you take. This doesn't just give us hope that there's a mechanism for feeling better, but with big names like Eric Topol doing a study on pre and post vaccine biomarkers, we might just get a handle on what's going on in our bodies too. We've also got establishment names like Dr Paul Glynn at UCLH studying immune response in long Covid and he's already on the right track. If you watch the webinar I'll post to in the description. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to be patient, look after ourselves and each other. Till next time.